So be, uh, before Quan gets started, I just want to say thank you first for, for volunteering. It's the first session, um, and we were like we were doing a little bit about we should find some people to turn up and speak. To, you know, the first one. We didn't really want it to be all about AWS. We wanted the community to speak. So thank you very much for you know stepping up and uh, doing the first uh, session for us. I really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. So even though it's supposed to be a bit more general, this is an AWS event, so I thought it would be better to keep a bit more to the subject before they throw me and Paul out, so just to be safe. So today's topic is developing on the cloud, um, developing security securely with AWS. So I'm from Horangi, we are a cyber security firm. So one of our products is a software as a service, it's an online um, vulnerability scanner. And this scanner, the application is hosted on AWS. So this presentation will be our, our experience developing on AWS and um, the issues we encountered and how various AWS services help us solve these problems that we faced. So, um, brief introduction of myself. I'm a cybersecurity consultant. I'm a developer by training. I'm a developer by training. <laughs> so, <coughs> Along the way, I started two startups before I, I joined PricewaterhouseCoopers. So it was a Wi-Fi monitoring startup and an e-commerce startup. So as you can tell, I was a co-founder in those startups. So in those areas, security was particularly important. So that is how I got into security. And then I joined PwC um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, became a technology consultant focusing on security. And at that point in time, I started hating the developer part of me. Because whenever I coded something or did something, I would realize that there are a lot of issues with the code, like security loopholes and so on. So now I just uh, I enjoy making and breaking stuff, but now mostly breaking stuff. And so, Scott, do you want to go back slide and just talk about the crash stuff? I think because I'm quite interested in how it's cool. Oh, okay. So there are so many security certs out there, right? Like your um, E C E H, the ethic ethical. C E H. I can't remember what it stands for. Yeah, but so many of them. So I was exposed to this while I was with PricewaterhouseCoopers. I found um, OSCP the most interesting because it's a hands-on course. What happens is they, they will give you access to a VPN with a couple of machines that can be compromised. You go in and compromise these machines and that's also what you do in the exam. After that, um, CRESS, which, is, which started from UK, I think, started making its presence known in Singapore, Australia and a couple of other countries. So now a lot of government organizations, when you're doing bids for security and so on, they'll ask for these certifications. So that's what I did, and I got um, OSCP and CRES. So they are basically just certifications to prove that you can do something. You can do security and break stuff. The good thing about the CRES example, those who don't know, is uh, it's quite difficult to get. Um, it really raises the bar on the, the exams that are up in the past. Um, and it basically certifies you as a hardware. Okay? So if you see anyone who's CRES, like kudos. I was crest. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer. Yeah. I need crest because I look like this scrawny Asian dude. <laughs> and I say I can break your stuff, you don't believe me. So the agenda today is really simple. It's how we started out, how Horangi's technology stack started out, where Horangi is right now and what we can improve in the future with respect to our infrastructure and what AWS provides. So what we started out, time to launch in three months for our product. So this is a software as a service hosted on AWS infrastructure. It's a infrastructure, it's a vulnerability scanner. So let's start off um, with the prehistory of Horongi's product. It's a really uncomfortable feeling of my butt moving on its own. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. Let me check if any. Hello? Well, let's carry on first. Can everyone hear me at the back? All right. So, um, how our architecture started. So I'm going to start from version 2 of our architecture, which is what Horangi is like three months before launch. There's no point starting from the start. Right at the start, our development was a bit of a mess because it was mostly local development, everyone brought it together on a single server. There was no security in place or anything like that. So, 
Um, we started our initial sprint, like any other startup, focus on functionality, focusing on the minimum viable product. And then along the way, we found that we had to refactor the entire code base and rehaul, overhaul our entire environment. So we brought it onto AWS. So this is our original architecture. Um, I was made known during the PISA session, there are a lot of architecture solutions, certified people here, so I think that a lot of eyebrows twitching right now. This is a really bad design. We did not take into account any VPC, any submetting, any IP, whitelisting, blacklisting, any port. Every port was allowed in and out. It was a very bad design, that's what we started out with. So as you can see, we did put some um, measures in place. We thought about load balancing, auto-scaling, and so on. So what if a lot of people are trying to access our application at the same time? We made use of AWS um, Autoscaler in our main application server. We use Elastic Cloud Services, which is also from AWS, to help with our um, data analytics, and S3 for data storage. And so on the left side of the slide, you can see everything that was hosted on AWS. On the right side, you can see things that are out of AWS, which is our scan server. We do vulnerability scanning out of the scan server, so there's a lot of traffic coming out of that. But AWS has some conditions that won't allow us to do that freely, so we move that up. But other than that, everything's on AWS. So the priority is then application level security. So basically making sure no one can break our application because we are a vulnerability scanning application. <laughs> it's a bit of a reputational issue if our application gets broken into. So security, security with data at rest and in transit. Basically encrypting your data properly, making sure you've got proper SSH connections, you're using SSL and so on, and end-to-end -end encryption for, your, for important data. Ability to scale and handle unexpected loads. So this explains the auto-scaler and our load balancer. Redundancy and resilience. So with this, we use um, ECS Docker. I'm not sure if any of you have heard about this, but just check it out. It's really, really handy for that. Uh, Quan, just a quick question on uh, the application security stuff. You guys are experts in this. What sort of tools are you using or methodologies are you using? Any lessons learned for the guys? Okay, so um, for application level security, for web application security, in general, we like to follow the OWAP's um, testing guide. That's a pretty comprehensive guide you can find online. Just Google OWASP uh, testing guide and a PDF file will pop up on Google. So what it covers is the various categories such as infrastructure security, configuration of your server, um, input output validation, authentication, many things. It's a pretty comprehensive list. Cool. So that was our priorities then. And then concerns that cropped up from that structure we had was along the way, in the three months leading up to, to deployment, anyone who has worked with a development team who have experienced this, a lot of problems crop up, um, functionalities are made, uh, changes are made at the last minute to functionalities that you have. So at, at the code level, a lot of changes are being made. So development was paused for us to clean up our environment and our code. We did not have a BBC at the time. It came to our attention that that would be an issue because anyone can just ping port 22, um, SSH on our server and find that it's open. Someone might try something funny or a new vulnerability might crop up the next day. It might not react in time. So it's unfortunate, but at that time we couldn't just stop development and put in a VPC. So we just carried on and we tried to mitigate all these risks partially with pen testing and network audits. So all these are some of the concerns. The major issues we had were because we were using Docker, whenever the Docker instance resets, we lose all the logs in, in the instance. So as a developer, um, as, a, as a DevOps person, that is a huge problem. Because whenever your logs reset, you lose everything, you don't know what was happening in the server before it crashed. Or did someone try to do funny, something funny to your server, any suspicious traffic and so on. You wouldn't be able to tell that. And then there was no centralized logging system. So if you want to figure out what was going on in the application, you have to go to reuse um, Python with a Flux, Flux server. If you want to figure out what's going on there, you have to go down to that server log and look at it. And then you have to check the logs on Amazon to see what um, ACL commands are being passed and so on. It was an insecure environment. There was no separation of production and developer networks and everyone had excessive access permissions. So basically on Amazon's really, really useful uh, EM, IAM, the identity management, identity access management, everyone was allowed to do anything. So we had a, we had just had a normal tester um, who's supposed to test, test 
use cases on our application. So that person could actually create an admin account and kick other people out at one point in time, but we changed that, of course. So. Uh, just to stop on that IAM stuff, right? So um, for those of you that don't know, when you create an account in AWS, we give you the flexibility to create many users, users doing groups, and you can be really specific about what they should do. Guess what, and then, you, know, you know what you just mentioned, you make it easy, you just give everyone permission to do everything, right? And that's how it starts. Um, uh, and then, I guess, you know, it's worth <coughs> then around locking that down and then after the fact, right? Uh, but it's, again, shared security model, no responsibility to say who does what in your environment, you know? Is it a storage engineer? Is it a security person? And so forth, and they should only have the permission, just like normal systems, principles of these privilege, separations of duties, and so forth. So you can use IAM to do that. I'll go into more detail about it later, but basically what we did to solve this was to define user roles, as with any application. So you've got your engineers, you've got your infrastructure people, you've got your testers, and so on. We defined those roles, we gave those roles only the permissions that they would need, and nothing more. So that's IAM for you. And then, time to launch in one week, what we did to resolve the urgent issues with the help of Amazon services. For logging, we manually added server logging to the application, le to the application level. So this helped us streamline the logs all through one location, all through one screen. And th this was done using uh, Kinesis. So Amazon Kinesis, we created basically a pipeline for all this logging data. All this was fed to S3. So S3 is just very cheap storage, basically. All the logs went there. I'm not going to go into detail, but this is what it looks like. Part of it, what it looks like. We created a delivery stream. All the logs will go through this, and then you'll be delivered to our S3 instance for storage. Does, it, <coughs> does this fuzzy mark say encryption or unencryption? Basically, I hope it says encryption. Yeah, it, it does say encrypted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My boss is here. It looks like too many letters. It looks like it looks like two more characters than the <laughs> It is encrypted now. If it wasn't, the screenshot was taken. So. Yes. Uh, did you put security same CloudWatch logs at that time? Sorry? CloudWatch logs. We haven't configured CloudWatch at that time. So CloudWatch is also a really handy service that we could have used. But because from where we started from, we started from developers who are not used to using um, cloud-hosted <coughs> services. We did use things like DigitalOcean and so on, but not really um, any provider that had the scale of Amazon services. So. Having Elasticsearch hosted as a service, that was pretty new to us. Having a relational database, having CloudWatch, all these utilities that come along with the, the EC, EC2 um, hosting service was quite new to us. So it took us some time to learn about that and pick that up. So we did um, logging the, the old way. That's a, sorry, that's a good question. Are you using CloudWatch logs? Yeah, yeah. we use a lot of CloudWatch logs. You do? Yeah, we need to do that because uh, we cannot store the logs at an uh, instance, a uh, local place, right? Yeah. And we used to use this, it's just not NG as well, but it's not, you know, uh, there is no redundancy in security. Yeah. So at the end, we use this double logs. It's okay. very simple to set up. And just, just a question to go further on that. When you've got the Cloudworks logs agent installed, where do you check, where, where are you put in that? It's automatically go to what watch logs is in S. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's the, the issue that we have now is that if the application have a lot of logs, uh, the operation the operation team is very takes very long time to query the specific logs because we are we, are, we use this REST API yeah. and there is I think there's open source tools that allows you to do like uh, querying the logs very easily yeah. human like AWS logs for human something like that yeah. in GitHub but it's still very slow so yeah that's that the, the only concern that we have now. Okay. And then for the insecure environment, we did seg segregation via VPCs. So if you guys don't know what VPCs are, they are virtual private, um, virtual private clouds. So it essentially allows you to create something like a subnet within your Amazon machines and you can define security groups and assign them. And then what we did was we defined the security groups. We allowed um, for, particular, for particular machines in the VPC that did not require external access, for example, database servers and so on, we only assign internal IP. So this could not be queried from external addresses. If you go to the host name assigned to our database from the internet, you will get nothing. It will just give you an error 404. And this will only accessible via a VPN server. So another thing that came helpful was um, OpenVPN, which is the VPN service we are using. It's available on the Amazon Marketplace. 
So it's just what happens is you see something like that on the marketplace. It's a deployable instance of open uh, VPN. All you go, all you do is you go in, you click deploy, choose your instance size, and then configure open VPN and cook is up. So in the past when we did that, when we did this on um, say digital ocean service, it took a bit longer. This makes it more convenient, but whatever whatever works for us at the time, whatever was the fastest, this was the fastest way. And then this is the architecture that we had after um, a bit of modification. So this was done within three months of launch. We tried to put everything properly and make it a bit more secure. So you can see that we put everything in a VPC. We defined security groups for public and private access. And then we also made sure that the ports allowed were very strictly controlled. For example, for the public, for the public um, security group, only port 80 and 443. So those are your HTTP ports. Only HTTP and HTTPS allowed. Any output, uh, any traffic going out goes through the NAT that we have. Same thing for the private network, the the private um, the private security group. So only SSH and the VPN was allowed to go through. So that's basically port 22. And because we use OpenVPN, there was a web interface. We also allowed port 43 and port 80. But we tried to limit access as much as possible. Everything else that didn't require external access. Our development server, Jenkins, control servers, our reverse DNS, everything else was um, refused access to the to anything outside of the VPC and outside of the, the VPN control. I got a question. So, uh, in your experience setting up the VPC and the security groups, do you think that was easy or difficult? Or? So Paul wasn't around that time, but there was a lot of sleepless nights. Oh so. yeah, I was hoping you say it's easy. Let me ask you again. Was it easy or hard? <laughs> it was really easy. Man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It should be easy. But my, my so my follow-up question was going to be, well, I don't know if these servers are Linux or Windows or what you're using, but let's assume they were Windows. Yeah. In the security configuration that you've got with these security groups, do you think you would have been protected now against like WannaCry or ransomware like that? Definitely, especially with the port blocking. Yeah. So by defining only port 80 and 443, we are reducing our attack surface by a lot. So the hard part was learning how to use these services because there are, there are so many of them. You got you just got to look through. So the, Amazon has actually pretty good documentation. The mistake we made was we didn't dig in the documentation. We just tried to not hammer everything out as fast as possible and made a lot of mistakes along the way. So we learned it the hard way. So that, that's why it was tough for us. But there's, there's pretty good documentation. Look through that and you're quite well covered. So for us, that's the, the journey we took, but it could have been easier, a lot easier. So, for the insecure environment, um, as you can see from the architecture diagram I showed you just now, a lot of changes were made. In addition to that, as I mentioned previously, the IAM rules. We, reviewed, we did a review of all our roles and um, authorization permissions. For example, not everyone can access the marketplace anymore, not everyone can access particular services or APIs that Amazon provides to the IEM service. We restricted permissions on the individual services as well. For example, for S3 and our relational databases, we only allow particular whitelisted IPs to go through. So in this individual services, you can actually define um, how you want to restrict, either by certificate, if I remember correctly, or by IP whitelisting. So we chose IP whitelisting because we're using internal IPs within the VPC. And lastly, this was a pain for everyone, but we activated 2FA on anything we could, we could get our hands on. Come on. Yeah, so what we used was um, the Google Authenticator application. So everyone's phone could just install Google Authenticator. We just sync that application to the 2FA services. IAM has it, um, OpenVPN has it. So those are the two largest entry points to our infrastructure. So both are protected by 2FA. <coughs> and this screenshot is a bit small, but you can actually see in IAM policies, there's a policy that says false MFA, so false multi-factor authentication. We activated that. Every, anyone who didn't have um, MFA will log into the Amazon console and find that they didn't have access to anything. So. There were a few people complaining that day, but everyone activated 2FA pretty quickly. Sorry, is that, is that, is that just for developers or administrators, or what's, what's kind of like where you say anyone who has access to the console is, uh, 
needs to affect. Yes, that, that's basically what we did, except for the administrator who had to set it up first. Cool, fantastic. So we, we are trying to be on the safe side, so yeah. that's why we did this. And um, you know, just a hammer home why that's super important, right? The AWS platform secure, you could set up your security group securely, you've got a really good setup. But you know, if you sit in at lunchtime in Harangi headquarters, wherever that may be, and someone sends you an email where you check your LinkedIn and you click on that piece of malware, and they start keylogging you and your password, and someone from the other side of the internet, maybe Brazil, could just log into your servers and start deleting things, right? So having multi-factor authentication, even if they steal your password, they need to physically go rob plan and steal this phone number, right? To have the two factors to actually log into AWS. Okay, so it's super important to enable it, and as John said, not just for your admins, but for everyone, because everyone's kind of. Thank you. So, in addition to something you know, in terms of security, in addition to a password, your username, something you know, we also included another factor, which is something you have, which is your phone, and the Google Authenticator, Google Authenticator application installed on it. So that's multi-factor authentication. And then, well, that's the end of the changes we have. So this is roughly what the architecture we had when we launched our service. But of course, there are other things we can do and other things you're working on along the way, improving security. Next thing. Right, that's, uh, that's a very st uh, steep job to view. One, one last thing, one last thing. <laughs> Anyone who's seen the Apple launches, you know, the one last thing is always the best. I'm a bit of an Apple traitor. Uh, this okay. looks like a MacBook, but right? it's a <laughs> Apple yeah. sticker with a dial behind. Okay. <laughs> I'm interested. I'm interested. I'll tell, tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> So one last thing, there's still many things we can work on to improve on our development environment and our architecture. So the first thing that comes to mind would be high availability VPNs, because it's so easy to launch open VPN instances and we have people working, currently Horangi has presence in five different countries and our developers, our infrastructure people, our testers are, can, can get pretty spread out sometimes and everyone is connected to the Singapore VPN. So you can imagine that can be a bit of an issue, especially if you are working away from, say, Manila, at a, at a pretty isolated part of Manila. Well, you can't get isolated in Manila. Beach in in, in Philippines. <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that. You'll find that it's really slow, especially if you have to go through the VPN and with the security measures in place. A way to mitigate that will be high availability VPNs so from multiple countries routing back to our VPC or our internal network. So another thing we also want to do is to define the environment in cloud formation. So this would allow us to deploy, um, deploy more easily and redeploy things repeatably. So this would give us a bit more control and, and ensure that security is in place. And lastly, cloud trail. So we are alerted to any changes made and react, we can react instantly. So this is one of the more important things that we failed to do initially. Also implement cloud trail to, to look at the logs and trace whatever is going on. So an example of how cloud trail and cloud formation can work together. One thing that one scenario we have thought of that work, can be solved easily by this. For example, your ACL has been changed. Um, cloud trail detects this and then Lambda triggers to redeploy everything via cloud formation. And that will actually pretty much automate your your security solution in a way. So that's one thing we are trying to do in the future. I'm gonna keep this short because it's getting late and I only have one slice of pizza and I'm hungry. So, is anyone want to order food? any more food? Uh, oh! <laughs> okay, I'll take the blame for that. Sorry, we thought 20 pizzas was enough for tonight. Uh, okay, question. Uh, since uh, your, your company is a new startup company, uh, any enterprise customer already subscribed to your service? Um, we are in this discussion with several enterprise customers. Yeah. I can't tell you any names. Okay. Um, in terms, actually, yes, we have a few mm. uh, enterprise customers that are already with us. Okay. In Singapore, our presence in Singapore is not very strong yet. We're still building on that. But there are customers in um, Philippines, mm. Indonesia, and Thailand, enterprise customers that are using it. Okay. Singapore, only a handful. So with your, your, your journey on AWS, um, what was kind of your experience of joining these different services together? I mean, internally we refer them as like Lego blocks. You know, you've got different pieces that you put on top of each other and build into something else. Was, was it like a, was it a, a very difficult thing? 
like sharp learning curve? I think these things work together or? I think it's a very natural progression with the majority of cloud provider services. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you look at programming maybe 30 years ago, right, everyone had a mindset that everything had to be built yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then people started getting libraries all over the place. You just download a library from GitHub and then you get a whole bunch of functions already in place. So the way I think of it is that Amazon services something like that. Mm -hmm. Individual libraries, you're making everything's being made easier to do because it's just there. It's pre-created. It's easy to put together. Or like you said, a jigsaw. Mm. But the, from the, a developer the layer background, blocks, yeah, yeah. yeah like they the, uh, blocks. Unofficial uh, messaging we like to use. Yeah. So cool. No, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that because I've been through the same process myself, trying to bring multiple AWS services and tie them into one uh, delivery, whether it's an application or one particular, you know. Yeah. It's definitely a very welcome progression. Okay. Like in the past, if I wanted an encryption library on C, I might have to code it myself. Now I just download a bouncy castle library. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think AWS services is something like that, but for the cloud. Perfect. Thank you. Any other, time? <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, okay so it's good to talk to you. Can you share with us uh, what kind of fees that we have? I mean, the risk will always be out there. I mean, as the as the operating systems and the services you run on an edge, there will definitely be more and more issues that come, and they'll be patched less and less often. So if you say that because of the application restriction, you're unable to update the OS itself, we can look at uh, defense in depth as a, as a mitigation factor. So do not, maybe you restrict that particular service or vulnerable machine to only specific IP addresses, for example, or you restrict it within a VPN. So you got a VPN, you got to connect the VPN before you can access it. So in your particular case, I would say think about it as access, uh, as security in depth, instead of trying to solve the problem directly because you find they can't do it. But of course, at the end of the day, ideally what we want to approach is to, well, to nip the problem in the butt. So to upgrade to a later version of the operating system that does not have that problem. I'd actually challenge you to try as hard as you can to work out how um, you can treat your servers as devices that you don't really care that much about. Right? The important thing is there are four or five that are hosting your production application. If you need to kill one in order to replace it with a special one, that shouldn't matter. Um, and so try and get to that point where you can literally say, a server is just an unimportant block of uh, processing power, right? And then you can patch things at yeah. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. On your busiest day, you can start taking down a few servers, patch them, bring them up, make sure they're okay, the service is okay, and just keep rolling through. Yeah, we have, can easily do that in a uh, web application or things that is when it's like a elastic uh, load balance, but we have a lot of uh, legacy application as a big batch processing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I come from my background, yeah. uh, I completely sympathize with you. <laughs> more, uh, more than, I mean, uh, so, so some of my, my customers now, they're, they're running 10,000 Windows 2003 servers which went end of life like eight months ago, two years ago almost. Done. How do they deal with these problems? So there's, there's like this mitigation. Um, are they inter internet facing? No, okay. That's one step that we can we can we can mark them down on. Um, but we don't want to sit there forever. long. So certainly certainly have a, a happy to have a chat with you about that. I would say start with us. Start with a risk analysis, look at what the potential attack vectors are, and then try to shut off. So what you're doing is actually defense in depth. The port is vulnerable, the particle service is vulnerable, try to limit that. But like you said, at the end of the day, you try to solve that problem. But do you leverage on the party's uh, scan engine? So say, do you leverage on the party's uh, scanning engine to do the vulnerable uh, scanning function? Um, I say, uh, 
uh, bit nine, okay, uh, of course, uh, carbon black. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of uh, uh, so-called anti malware uh, engine to do that. So we do leverage on a couple of open source and um, some of the stuff we develop internally okay. for the things that you mentioned. For example, on NASA scanner and all that, a lot of them have their own. Of course, it's their business, right? Yeah. So they Can have their own. Yeah. rules of how you can use it and so, yeah. so on. So what we do is we develop internally, we have our own products, and we also try to leverage on a bit on the open source community. Because there's a lot of talent over there and development is pretty constant for some some of the so-called, for example, the, the malware detection rules and so on. Some of them are a pretty good source for that. Yeah, just to add to that, um, in a previous slide, um, at least six months ago before I worked for AWS, um, we use Carbon Black, uh, and it's an awesome tool, and you can run it on AWS. It works fine. Oh yes, you, you might want to check out the AWS Marketplace, so mm -hmm. a lot of the tools are there, so you can just deploy them. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you have a product, right? So, in the market, I'm going to I was doing for the business security and so I was working on multiple uh, tools. So what specialty on the uh, tool is something uh, not that in some way to be high? Is there anything specialty in your tool? So our our tool is currently being in the process of integrating with um, AWS Marketplace. It's not there yet, mm -hmm. but our developers are working on it because there are some APIs we have to integrate in the meantime. Um, so what we were aiming at initially was we tried to provide a service for every category, every segment of the marketplace mm -hmm. for your startup, for your small, your medium businesses, enterprise businesses, mm -hmm. and companies that are big enough to require something customized. So at every level of that, we have our own set of tools and services to provide. For example, we have something called the Hunter Gatherer, which is an uh, agent deployed on the individual workstations. So we use that for incident response. If something happens, we activate the agent, gather information from that particular machine, encrypt it, upload to Amazon S3, and then we'll get it from Amazon S3 and decrypt on our analysis machines. So some of these services, of course, as a startup or small medium business, you're not interested in. So we try to provide something that's cost effective and every segment of the business can use. I think I'll add to that as well. Like, I mean, it's, it's a local company, they're based on the ground here in Singapore. If you reach out to some of these other companies in the marketplace, you're not going to get a response, or you have to wait You have to wait until America wakes up, right? When the sales rep calls you back, or doesn't call you back. So one of the benefits is the guys are here locally, they've got some local customers, and, you know, they're, uh, they're flexible, they can customize, so it's not a, a stuck in stone problem. Uh, last question, what's the VC's injection? Venture capital? Sorry? Your venture capital, uh, the funding. Oh, the funding? Yeah. Oh, I'm afraid I can't review that, so. <laughs> okay. What was the question? What was the venture capital <coughs> to inject for this company? No comment. That's what I was going to say. No comment. Come on, thank you. Fair enough. <laughs> um, if there's no, there's no question. Yeah, okay. I have a question around the encryption. Right? You did have a story about the migrating from the plane storage to encrypted storage, right? Uh, maybe this is for AWS Cloud as well. Uh, what kind of uh, lesson learned or pain point or maybe setback that you have when you do this migration? Okay, and then the second question, is there any simple calculator for us to estimate the cost? We have like yeah. a few, like EPS storage, uh, yeah. RPS storage, yeah. S3, yeah. there's so many things that like, we have. So it's actually a cost calculator, but I think you'll be a better guy than Yeah, but for, for sure. services versus services. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll give you a run through it. So there is a calculator, you're absolutely right. It's called the, the simple monthly calculator. You go to the website, you search for it, and it basically lists all our services. You put in how much you want to use them, and it spits out basically the cost that's going to be associated with that. So in terms of encryption, that really means our service for KMS, key management service. To give you an example of the cost of KMS, right? It's basically AES-256 encryption. It encrypts your server uh, volumes uh, at rest. Uh, you can also use it to perform ad hoc encryption of files. Uh, you can push in clear text to get outside the text. Um, the, that is charged at one dollar per key a month. Okay. okay, so twelve dollars for a year if you use one key, and then there's a very small charge for API calls. So you're looking at you know zero zero cents per API call. So you end up with something like fifteen dollars if you use it in anger for one key over the year. So fifteen bucks. 
Okay. Very, very cheap. So it's just uh, the encrypt and decrypt process from byte of the data that is then cost in No, so, so what you're paying for is the key management and the key protection. That's the dollar per month. The actual encryption decryption is completely free. Right? We want to encourage customers to encrypt their data. It's a good thing. So we're not going to charge people to do encrypted storage. I, I, I think another another angle on that is um, like for things like EC2, EBS, uh, 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 volume service, is it's all all transparent, right? So you can encrypt, you can encrypt your 100 terabyte volume, my like, terabyte. Volume, so. I'm going to show you that very quickly in the moment when we when we yeah. But 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 when you do go to things like uh, Redshift, which is our uh, data warehouse sort of product, they're absolutely transparent about the the. Performance penalty that uh, uh, encryption may incur. So we say, generally, if you're working with uh, Redshift, you're going to incur like five to ten percent um, performance penalty. So, I believe there is an extra cost there because the encrypted storage will be have billion extra for you, right? Oh, we didn't get it. How many how many percent is that? You pay the king, not the king. Playing playing bits or side bits with it. I will need extra more mega gigabit. If you want if you want to use it one key for KMS encryption, you're paying around fifteen USD a year. Yeah, okay, let's say so it's incredibly counterintuitive. You're paying for the key mountain, not the amount of data you're encrypting. So if you encrypt ten gigabytes of data, fifteen dollars. If you're encrypting 10 petabytes of data, we're at $15. And, uh, if you're saying that there's a, there's a differential though between unencrypted and encrypted on disk, it's like how much space it's going to take up, but it's yeah. a large oh, scale. Oh, you mean it's a tiny, tiny fraction. It's not huge. It's unmeasurable. Yeah. 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 It, Okay, from AWS point of view, uh, do you have any validations uh, to pop into this uh, marketplace? Do we have any what, sorry? Validations uh, process to pop into this uh, marketplace. Yeah, we do. So if you want to be listed in the marketplace, you have to work with our partner team to attest that you've gone through certain checks and balance, mm -hmm. you know, that you're a real company, that your product is fit for purpose. Um, there's, a whole, there's a whole process that our partner team runs for that, yeah. And so, so what you do then is if you, you know, um, if you're looking at security products that are listed in the marketplace, um, you know you can either speak to our partner team like John and uh, yep. Eric who just left, and give you sure. advice on how to implement them because it's still very much a shared a shared model. When even if you deploy a partner solution, you need to figure out how it works or work with the the solution architects from the customer directly. Like, we need to do some paperwork to, to yep. put it on marketplace basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyone questions for Pan? No. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. So that's all. If anyone wants to flip me a name card, do it here because my boss is here. Yeah. <laughs> no, on the email address. I'm kidding. <laughs> right. So I've just got a couple of slides to run. I know we're going over a little bit on time.